thank you very much. I would like to thank the Department of History and the University of Vanderbilt for giving me this opportunity to discuss an aspect of uh, the history of Senegal, but within a larger framework which is a kind of global framework which is defined by the location of the city I'm going to talk about, which is Saint Louis du Senegal, which is at the mouth of the Senegal River on the Atlantic, uh, on the Atlantic coast. I would like also to thank uh, uh, my colleague Moses Ochono for a generous introduction. We're just talking about you know, the year we met, and it was long ago. <laughs> so. In February 2008, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, delivered an address on the controversial subject of Islam in English law. The lectures that engage with the question of whether the British civil justice system could accommodate non-Christian legal codes, Islam and Orthodox Jewish was, according to many observers, journalists, scholars and politicians, and I quote, learn, recondite and occasionally impenetrable. Needless to say, the outrage was not occasioned by William's mention on Orthodox Jewish law. For the purpose of public discussion, it was the word Sharia that was radioactive. The difficult question was, can Islamic civilization mesh with the Western world? Although the historical narrative I'm offering today is not located in the West, the story is precisely that of the meshing of Muslim law with the French colonial world in Saint Louis du Senegal. Muslim law was given an official status in the colonial governance system and the public space of the city. It was forced on the colonial administration that opposed it from the late 18th century to 1916. But it came to existence with the creation of public institutions without having ever been packaged as Sharia. One of the most interesting aspects of the history of Islam in this region is constant reference to Islam, to an Islamic institution, but without ever using the term of Sharia, which is today one of the most important terms in the discussion about Islam in the global public space. And the people who are involved in this process call themselves the originaire. I will come back to that. But the idea of originaire refers to something which is close to the term native, that we are the residents. We are the original people of this piece of land. And as a result, it gives us rights, the right of the first occupant, but the right of being the indigenous people of a place. The originaire, as I say, promoted actively the presence side by side of Islamic local and colonial institutions. They open up a space of transaction that shape the civic and aesthetic as well as the religious rituals, both Catholic and Muslim, of the city. The member of that community, which again called them the originaire, 
call also themselves Vodomundar, which means the children of the city. The Senegalese name of the city is Ndar, N-D-A-R. And it's important to keep in mind the de denomination of Domundar. And you see here the shape of the city, which is a small piece of land actually, which is this piece of land. And it's divided into a northern part here and a southern part. And this topography is important because the northern part is structured around a mosque, which indicate the religion of the residents. And the southern part is organized around the church, which also signal the religion of, 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 of the resident. And you see here more clearly how the city looks like between the river, which is here and the Atlantic Ocean. And this will be the new development of the city in the 20th century. But my talk is mostly concentrated on the, eye, on the island. So the members of the children of Saint Louis using expertly the resources of free languages wall of Arabic and Hassaniya. Hassaniya is the vernacular Arabic used by the Bedans, Umos, which is the population which is living in the other side of the river, the Moors. So the, the, the Arabic vernacular of Mauritania is called Hassaniya. And this is a language which was also the language of the inhabitants of Saint Louis. So it's very important to keep in mind this, uh, you know, traveling between free languages because the traveling between free languages is, is also a traveling between free worlds. And the way in which those three words uh, would be articulated with the French word become one of the most important challenge, but also the encounter base in which the inhabitants of this city will reinvent themselves from roughly the French Revolution to World War I. So what I'm interested in is how using actually those free languages, they constituted a moral community with a culture that drew not only on Islamic religious idea, but also on the political, economic, and social right conferred on them by their citizen status. I will come back to that because it's a very, very important discussion to discuss what it means in this context of the French empire uh, to be a French citizen and how such a status was actually also negotiated and reframed by, by the originaire. By constantly making claim based on their citizenship right, they initiated a twofold process, inserting themselves in the colonial narrative and fabricating a world of their own through a daily engagement with colonial policy and knowledge system, as well as with their Senegambian neighbors and their uh, uh, Senegambian neighbors' moral and social value. Here also I have to give up. Uh, when I'm talking about Senegal and Senegalese during this period, I'm basically talking about the people of Saint Louis. Senegal was limited to the city of Saint Louis before the uh, end of the 
uh, 19th century colonial uh, uh, expansion and the formation of the colony of Senegal, which is today Senegal. So to contrast the two population, the Senegalese, the residents of Saint Louis, and the rest, which is still uh, you know, made up of uh, uh, kingdoms which are independent. I talk about Senegalese here and Senegambian to incorporate Gambia within an ensemble which is not limited to Senegal today, but which was, you know, spilling over part of Mauritania, but also part of, of Mali, part of Guinea. The two Guineas were up you know, regions, if you want, of Senegambia. So when I'm referring to Senegambian, I'm discussing a population which are outside, if you want, the perimeter of the, the, perimeter of the colonial city. So what is important to keep in mind in, in the discussion I'm, I'm presenting is that the originaire the inhabitant of Saint Louis was defined, defining themselves not only in contrast with the French, but they were also defining themselves in contrast uh, uh, with the Senegambian. They were speaking the same language, they have the same religion, but their view uh, of their neighbors were inflicted by the French view. They believed that they were different. They believed that they were more civilized. They believed that they were best Muslims. And this is very important to keep in mind. It's actually what made this uh, country a country where you have on one hand the idea of a kind of homogeneity. But at the same time, what you see is actually the existence of two different cultures. The culture of, of the Atlantic enclaves, you know, and, and cities. I, Saint Louis became an important city with residents uh, granted citizenship, as I say, I will come back to that, in the context of the French Revolution. Gore of Dakar uh, became also a commune in the French parlance, which is a city with citizen in 1840. This small city, which is my hometown, they became also French citizen in 1880. And the last city where the population was granted citizenship is Dakar in 1888. So, and they constituted what is known as the four commune of Senegal. And their citizenship is very important to understand the process through which they invented themselves. So in this presentation, I'm revisiting the discussion about the space of maneuver left to colonial subject in imperial design, territorial, ideological, and epistemologic. Were they capable of reframing by their action and reaction those global design, like the mission to civilize, deploying local histories and vernacular practices to contain and subvert colonial ethnography. In the case of Senegal in particular, the four communes which are presented earlier, the Muslims took advantage of the tension provoked by the clash between the colonial administration and the Catholic clergy opposed understanding of a mission to civilize. I think we could discuss it in the Q&A, what I call the different approaches to the mission to civilize. 
So in doing so, I'm considering the early literature on the French policy of assimilation. And the critical book was published in 62 by Michael Crowder, Senegal, a study of the French policy of assimilation. So I'm considering that literature to the recent debate on empire. Party strategy, for example, in the nation and in its fragment, colonial and post-colonial histories, argues that at the heart of colonialism is the rule of difference that creates a binary split into colonizer and colonized. He insists on the inferiority and inequality of the later. Fred Cooper, on the other side, it colonialism in question, considered that it's more useful to emphasize the politics of difference instead of the rule of difference. For the meaning of difference were always contested and rarely stable. Has broad comparative studies suggest, as he insists, all empire in one way or another had articulated a difference with incorporation. The politics of colonial difference was expressed in dual structure for the governance of European and native that often includes separate legal codes and court of law, the exclusion of the native from the democratic politics of a metropole as well as the effort to segregate space and regulate sexual relations between the two groups. In the case of the originaire, this is what Ma Mahmoud Mamdani called uh, the bifurcation, the colonial bifurcation. But in the case of the originaire, colonial governance did not always imply discrimination and binary split. It's just that different people should be ruled differently. And this is, if you want, the basis on which the community of Saint Louis will be formed. The idea that they are different, but in a space they are sharing with another community and negotiating the administration of pluralism became basically the driver of the constitution of the community. The colonial space of Saint Louis was shaped by two global forces and their specific design. The Sahara, Sahara, Sahara Sahelian uh, world, which is uh, uh, along the Senegal River that was the result of multiple intellectual, aesthetic, but also erotic and seductive tradition, borrowing from multiple cultures and languages, the Soninke language, which was spoken in this region The Halpular language, which was spoken in this region, and the Wolof language, which was spoken in this region, which means that the Senegal River Valley was occupied by three distinctive communities speaking three distinctive languages. And it's those tradition and cultures which will be, which were converging in this converging in the city of, in the city of, of Saint Louis. So the Sahara Sahelian world is very important. It's why the Saint Louisian were speaking Hassaniya, but it's also why Arabic is so central in their world, because it's connected them to North Africa, to Egypt, and beyond Egypt to the Middle East. And those connections are the connections which created one of my colleagues called the West, the West African Islamic Library. And 
to understand such a library, we have to really go deep down into the ancient history of this region. It began probably long before uh, the, 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 the emergence of, 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 of Ghana, but it was consolidated by the Mali and the Sonrai Kingdom and the pilgrimage to Mecca, to Kanku Musa and Askia Muhammad. And, and this Islamic library is important because for more than, uh, you know, uh, sometime more than six, seven, eight centuries, the population of this region lived in a world which was connected with the world of the Arabic language, but the world of Islam also. Engaging with the literature, engaging with the law, but also engaging with uh, uh, the practice of Islam in a kind of dialogical uh, process, adjusting the religion to their own need, adjusting the religion to their own space. And it's, uh, we can actually indicate signals which are very important. If you look at the kind of uh, development of brotherhoods in this region, in particular the Sufi brotherhood, the most important brotherhood was the Kadriya which is a brotherhood which was actually funded in Baghdad, but which reached this region as early as the 16th century. And clerics, which are African clerics, are already spreading the world of this, uh, of this order. And the order will be contested in the early 20th century by another order, the Tijania, which emerged uh, between Algeria and Morocco, uh, funded by a North African clerics. And the order will uh, reach West Africa uh, uh, through a cleric born here who traveled all over West Africa, went to Mecca through the Sokoto Caliphate, came back in the early 1830s uh, and began a jihad, Elijah Omar Tal, who is one of the most important uh, Muslim warriors of this region. And Omar will spread uh, the Tijaniya and which will become the largest order still today uh, in West Africa. And the last order is what, the first order which was created by black clerics. And this is also very important to keep in mind. The tension between an Islam which is uh, uh, still actually uh, uh, holding reference from the uh, Arab world and an Islam which claim an indigeneity which is uh, excluding relationship with the Arabs and not taking the Arab into account in their discussion about Islam. So in addition to those religious, if you want, connection, uh, you have also the uh, ethnic connection, ethnic and cultural, and, 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 and a tension, which is a tension of how Islam is received. The reception and ethnic reception of Islam shaped also the understanding and the practice of Islam. So you have a religion, you have ethnicity, and you have a third force, which is quite an interesting force. In French, we call it, it was called Islamology. It's the study of Islam by colonial officers and the production of a knowledge which 
tended in the early 20th century to establish a separation between an Islam which is carried by white people, an Islam which is pure, orthodox, literate, scriptural, textual, and an Islam which is black. The French will call it Islam Noir. And that Islam Noir is, of course, magical and imagistic. So the contrast is, co is a contrast between a written religion, a doctrinal religion on one hand, and a religion which is imagistic. The script and the image presents actually the contrast between those practices. So it, that mixture which played a critical role also in shaping the identity of the people of San Luis. And the tension between those different, if you want, uh, those different impulses, the impulse of Arabic literate, the impulse of Islam noir magical, but also the ethnic impulse, which is outside, actually, the perimeter of, 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 of religion. And the last, if you want, driver into this discussion is the fact also that the colonial administration decided to use Arabic for administration. And the coupling of Arabic with administration, but also with a racialist conception of Islam Noir created, if you want, a kind of logic of separation, but also a logic of inclusion. If you want, this is the first global force shaped by local history, which is impacting the space of Saint Louis. The second is the force of the, Atlant the French Atlantic world. And of course, I'm making this distinction between the Atlantic has a global force and the specific ways in which the French Atlantic was shaped. And it's defined by the politic of assimilation and the configuration of a colonial public space was shaped infrastructure and resources resulted from the conflict and cooperation between the originaire and the colonial administration. As an Atlantic enclave established in the early phase of the building of European empire, marked by the competition between Portuguese, Dutch, British, and the French, Saint Louis accumulated resources from different moments and operation of addition and subtraction. The two processes shaped a culture of transaction, was lexicon, was commerce and political negotiation, a culture which is a culture of enclaves. And in French, uh, you know, it's called une culture des comptoirs. And the idea of enclave is precisely uh, showing the two forces, if you want, in contact, the internal force and the external forces. Saint Louis is the first French territorial stronghold in Africa and the oldest colonial city established by the French on the West African coast. It was established in 1659 on an island at the mouth of the Senegal River. The city was founded at the site of a non-permanent small fishing village settled by the Olaf people. With Gore, an island of the coast of the Cap Verde Peninsula, which was successfully occupied by the Portuguese and the Dutch before the French occupation in the 17th century, Saint Louis became in the 18th century a port city. An urban center was development is largely influenced by the traffic of ideas, people, and goods across the Atlantic as well as across the Sahara and the Senegambia interland. 
the territory on which the city was erected was not the product of conquest. Rather, it was a new settlement established according to a deliberate policy of colonial occupation devised at the moment of the competition for colonial territory. While Saint Louis was occupied by the French monopoly Compagnie du Senegal, traders and sailors since the early years of the first decade of the 17th century, no permanent urban population stabilized on the island until the second half of the 18th century. Urbanization was in turn linked to the emergence of slave population who were at the forefront of the urban and cultural change processes. French inhabitants were few, and fewer still lived in Saint Louis for their entire life. With time, two local groups eclipsed the European population in numbers, the Métis, which are the mixed blood people, and they will define themselves as Métis and are still now defined as Métis, which is the process of miscegenation and they are of mixed and European African heritage. They were the children, grandchildren, and later descendants of unions between European men and local women. Among them, the Signar, which are one of the most, one of the most important group. And I have pictures of Signars. These are the Signars became influential intermediaries between Europeans, administrators, and traders, local traders, and neighboring political leaders. Their tie and familiarity with both European and African people, languages and cultures, allowed them to profit handsomely by brokering exchanges. Many Métis and Signar were Christians. Because of their link with the French community, the colonial government granted them French citizenship and the right to vote. Another community made up the second prominent local group. The French, I talk about them, call them originaire. They call also themselves habitant, which is inhabitant. And they consider themselves, as I mentioned, as the first notable inhabitant of Saint Louis. And I also mentioned that in Wolof, they call themselves Domundar, the children of Saint Louis. And it's not only because of origin, but it's also a signal, a culture, which is their culture. In, still today, they think that compared to other Senegalese, they are literate Muslim. And, and, and their relation is very important to so these are the Métis, who will play a central role in the economy and the politics of Saint Louis. And they will constitute the group of the Métis with, 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 with the Signar. And if you compare, these are, this is a classical inhabitant. And, uh, it's uh, much later, but the way he's dressed uh, indicates both the connection with North Africa, but also an, an identity, which is an identity of a literate Muslim. And this community will also be, members of this community will also be granted citizenship. And the granting of citizenship of, of the originaire who are Muslim will create a kind of, of situation which will be a very conflictual situation between the originaire and the colonial administration, in particular the churches, about the meaning of French citizenship. So it, it, it's really that world. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand, and trying to understand it by looking not only at, uh, at the politics in Saint Louis, but also looking at 
at, at, at the political economy of this and the importance of trade and trading. And, and one thing which is quite important to underline is that despite the close tie with intimate and intimate knowledge of French colonial society, the colonial legal system and commercial practices, the originaire neither resisted nor collaborated with the French. They sought instead to figure out how they could benefit from the system, while at the same time maximizing their autonomy and promoting their own African Islamic culture. For example, they refused to submit to the French civil code. Many of them were patron of Islamic learning center. Some were learned themselves. In the end, they drew on their multiple African and Islamic heritage, along with their understanding of French institutional and political infrastructure, the understanding of the Republican philosophy to build a vibrant civic culture. And they had two opportunities if you want to build that civic culture. Two opportunities which allow them to begin inventing, if you want, a kind of collective identity of their own, contrasted to the identity of the colonial administrator, but also of the merchants, the traders, the white traders. The first opportunity was the occupation of the island by the British between 1758 and 1779. And this is the opportunity which allowed them, as I was saying, to begin negotiating a political identity. Because many of the notables uh, the Metis, notable, were Christian, and the African notable were Muslim. They try first to negotiate to protect their religious right, because the British were Protestant. They did try to make sure that the British governor will not actually intervene in their religious practice, and it's through the negotiation of religious freedom, they began getting a kind of right to represent themselves. And such a right to represent themselves, they will turn it into the possibility of electing a mayor, what they did, but within the context of the British occupation. When the French returned, they forced them to recognize the institutions, which are the institutions created within uh, this, the context of the occupation. And of course, the French resisted. During the revolution also, they try to be present at the National Assembly in France. And actually, they sent their uh, claims to the National Assembly. And one of the most interesting aspects of their claims is they, were, uh, they fought against the abolition of slavery, because slavery was the foundation of their economy. So, so this is a very, very interesting twist in the kind of of, 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 of understanding representation. And these are people who were had African, were African or have some African origin, but they were against the abolition of, they were against the abolition of slavery. At the same time, they use the language of the revolution to actually get more autonomy and more right. 
as you know, the French Revolution is based on fighting against monopoly. They will use the same language to fight actually the power of the traders in the colony for the liberalization of the, of, 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 of the economic system. So what is important to keep in mind in this first phase of the occupation is the beginning of the creation of, of representative uh, institution. And it's quite interesting to see how they engage the discussion. They engage the discussion by making this contrast between being governed and being administered. They try to open up a space based on the idea that they should be governed. And being governed is being represented. When you are administered, you are like an object. You are not represent, represented. So the fight for representation became very, very important. The second opportunity to reinforce this position of being governed is the British reoccupied Saint-Louis in the context of the war of the revolution and the war of Bonaparte. So they occupied Saint-Louis between 1809 to 1816 and returned uh, uh, the colony to the French in uh, 1817. And one very, very important development is when the French governor entered Saint Louis, he tried to reestablish uh, the governance system which existed before the British. And the reaction of the originaire was to put him back in his boat and send him to Gorée, forcing the French to negotiate with them and forcing them to put in place, if you want, legal institutions. And in relation uh, to their neighbors, uh, one of the most interesting development is the beginning of uh, a kind of philosophical approach which will allow them to distinguish themselves from the Senegambian. They actually decided that they were the people of the sea. And the contrast is the Senegambians are the people of the land. And by defining themselves as the people of the sea, they were signaling to the French that they were cosmopolitan people, that the ethnography which was emerging in the 19th century, which was looking for narrative, for native, completely rooted, into a space they were not able to, to, to bypass. This originator was telling them, we are cosmopolitan. We understand European cultures. We understand uh, you know, Muslim, Arabic, Arab culture. But we understand our own culture. And this is what will allow them to open up a discussion which is an intellectual and philosophical discussion of the French, rejecting the French ethnography of these African tribes, rejecting the idea of Islam noir, and using Arabic as one of the most powerful weapons against the mission to civilize by actually presenting to the French their library. If the mission to civilize is based on identifying by barbarian, first has people without a script. They say, we have a script. We have been writing in Arabic. We have been even writing our own language in Arabic. So why should we need French as a language? 
if we have already one. We are practicing since, in some cases, uh, eight, nine centuries. You also say that being civilized is being able to engage with philosophy, Greek philosophy. We have been reading Plato and Aristotle. We can engage a debate around Aristotle and Plato. We have been doing astronomy. We have been doing math. So what are you bringing to us in addition to make us accept your lesson? So, and this discussion became very, very important in, as I say, the shaping of, the shaping of their identity. And in addition to that, they were also able to use, if you want, the language, which is the language of the Atlantic world. And this is what situated them at the crossroad of what I call multiple traffic, cultural traffic, the, 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 the traditional traffic of their own world, the traffic coming from the Sahara, but also the traffic coming from the Atlantic. And I would like to give just an illustration of the juxtaposition of these various values, you know, social references and language. If you read, for example, the Manimission papers uh, in Saint Louis in the 19th century, they reflect how wall of sociability and conception of slavery and freedom have infiltrated ideologically and materially the legal language of notary document, making it participate in the production and reframing of the wall of urban culture of the enclave. Such an intervention triggered the blurring of the public, the notary document, the private, the civil culture shared by the master and the slave, but also the understanding of bondage. In deploying useful and pertinent strategies to negotiate social relations both inside and outside the legal frame, reinforcing long-standing relationships such as patron-client relationship, articulating individual and collective identities, and obligating superiors free groups to provide gift and protection to inferior. So the outcome of those processes was the creation of a strong dominant wall of and Muslim urban culture that subordinated the languages and logic of the various agents that were active in the public space, including the colonial administration. It maintained a daily basis on a daily basis, a dialogical relationship and engagement with his various juridical, political, and cultural attributes and register. And studying the originaire of Saint Louis is basically what you see. It's a history of transaction. It's a history of juxtaposition. But it's also a history of moving back and forth which allows negotiation and is part of what I call uh, uh, an ideology of, 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 of negotiation. And the ideology of negotiation which, cre uh, uh, which will create a culture which is not limited to this group of African, but which is shared also by the Métis. This is also an important aspect of understanding the logic of difference, which does not exclude the sharing of one common culture and its deployment in different situations. So in this case, if we look at the signal, if we, look, if we read the Metis, what we see is that they are 
absolutely sharing the same culture, the same values in many cases than the, than the, uh, the, 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 the Africans, the blacks of the city of San Luis. And what it shows is that our approach of the At Atlantic enclave should go beyond trying to figure out how empire function there. We should look at as histories of urban development and to look at the culture which is produced by, by the urban development. It's why it's possible to compare Saint Louis to Luanda and see the urban dynamics in these two enclaves, which are absolutely identical, the importance of the role of women, the existence of institution in which Africans are playing a critical role, and sometimes they are the drivers of the political life in these, in, in these cities. And it's basically the result of the way in which actually urbanization developed. So, so what is important is looking at that history. And in this case, as I say, you have these three sources I talked about, the Senegambian tradition, the religious aesthetic and erotic library, and imaginary of the Moors. What is fascinating, in particular in Saint Louis, is all the re register of eroticism and seduction is coming from the north. The idea of what is a beautiful woman is an idea which has traveled across the Sahara, and which is very different from the idea. Today is probably no longer true, because the, 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 the Selwi imaginary has, is now dominant. But you had a difference in the idea of seduction, what it means to be seductive for a man or for a woman, was very different if you compare Saint Louis to the rest of Senegal because of the sources of. It's also very important to, uh, to understand that the wealthiest traders of Saint Louis uh, since the 19th century have been traveling to buy books, going to Jerusalem, going to Alexandria, going to Mecca from time to time. This is also an important aspect. So if we now look at Arabic and the role it's played in this identity formation, it's, as I was saying, not only an instrument to define an identity, but it is also an instrument of protest against the French. So Arabic polygamy became important element for people who are on one hand using the resources of their citizenship, the political resources of their citizenship on one hand and on the other manipulating the political institution to get what they wanted. And they got what they wanted in the second half of the 19th century. In the second half of the 19th century, they forced the French to establish free institution in the public space. In 1855, the French established two Muslim courts in Saint Louis. And in 1861, they set up a council to help the people of Saint Louis to go to pilgrimage from Mecca, to Mecca. And the institution, the inscription of this Muslim institution into the colonial public space changed radically the identity of the city, but also changed radically the functioning of uh, the colonial administration. Because at the same moment that the colonial administration was supporting the Muslims, 
they were fighting against uh, the church. And this tension will create a, a very interesting, a very interesting space and a very interesting way of understanding, if you want, the history of this region and the existence of something which the French will call beginning in the mid 19th century, la politique musulmane de la France. And it's very interesting to listen today to the French saying, you know, the Republic has never done anything with Islam. But it's absolutely untrue if you consider the empire. They were sleeping with Islam. And the other very interesting thing is the two Muslim tribunals they created in 18... 57 will be abolished by the nationalist elite at independence. So, so, so it's very interesting to see that trajectory and try to understand it. But the production of an identity which is Muslim reflected in an institution, the understanding of Arabic and the literate nature of the religiosity of Saint Louis, which you can contrast with uh, the, the Sufi orders of the Senegambian. The Islam of Senegambia is an Islam based on following a guide. The Islam of Saint Louis is a literal Islam which does not recognize guides. So this is also an interesting element in the way in which the identity and the role of Islam in this identification is, is so important. And when I was uh, mentioning, when I was mentioning this distinction between the North and the South, it's interesting to see how the Muslim has tried to create a space of their own, in particular to react also to the way in which, uh, to the way in which Christian in particular were understanding their social role and the importance of the social role. But at the same time, you see the kind of you know, merging of different tradition. I was talking about the mosque here and the church here. It's the same architecture. which also show a kind, this is the mosque. And this is the church. <laughs> and this also signal a kind of common identity and common way of, of, of thinking about, of thinking about identity. Another element which is important is why Arabic played such a critical role. Politically, they actually express themselves through petition. One of the most striking elements of, of, of their political expression is they were so quick in sending petition to the administration. It seems that they have been producing petition every week. And they knew so well the French law that they were able actually to use it and to use it against the French. It's why very quickly, when the Métis will began actually diversifying their activity, the first groups will emerge outside of the trading uh, community are lawyers. <laughs> our lawyers and, 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 and some doctors. So, what I have been trying to show is, and it's really what interests me, is the logic of assimilation should be read differently. 
that assimilation was not governed by the logic of the colonial administration, that these colonized subject, can we call them colonized, is a very complicated, were able to decide the terms based on which uh, actually the policy of assimilation is conducted. So the move to include and exclude was not controlled by the French. It was controlled by the population, which was the target of uh, the politics of assimilation. So to conclude, I would like to say that the religious infrastructures were one of the most significant expression of the Saint Louis community in a fair civic culture that blossom in the heart of the colonial space, space in cooperation and competition with its political, economic, cultural, and sometimes religious ambition. The Domunda religious practice, style of life and consumption evidence the will to introduce a rhythm and an indigenous civility into the colonial modernity. Choosing as much the mode of their inclusion as those of their exclusion from colonial society and activity, they betray themselves with their prerogative and the defense of an Islamic identity. On the one hand, their commercial success, their education strongly rooted in a perfect mastery of Arabic and one of his dialectical variants, the Mora Saniya, of their soft and sensual intonation and of their poetry offered them universal and literary formulas linked to the Arab and Muslim world. The search for the for a collective representation encourages them, encourages the development of a culture of petition writing and a systematic recourse to the rule of law, to lawyers and justice. The systematic search for representation and representativeness configured a public space whose contours were produced jointly by the colonial administration and the originaire notable. As a result, they created a solid civic culture of deliberation. Adding up their civic culture and moving away at the same time from the humanism and the universalism of the Enlightenment philosophy, they invested the public space with their liturgic chants, their Turkish I show the Turkish and Moroccan and Eastern inspired clothes, their burnuses, their incense, their matrimonial practices, particularly polygamy and the legality of their prayers that resulted in the quasi-permanent occupancy of religious infrastructure. Thus emerged at a Saint Louis style of humanism that was essential in the colonial context to maintain the civic community and its singular practices, its ceremonies and commemoration, its commemorative plaques written in golden Arabic letters, its deliberation, both with respect to the colonial administration and to the Senegambian religious practice. The emblems were produced by matrimonial alliances, Islamic expertise, professional activities, and a mastery of the Arabic language. The frequentation of religious literature, a strong participation in civic and civil activities demanded by the colonial and community of authorities. The civility was reflected in the style of life decor and decoration of the body, particularly of, for women, dress, food, and way of walking, feeling, and talking. Distinctively Saint Louisian, 
the contour and grammar of the civic community was constantly reconfigured in the colonial town. Their civic power, essential to the construction and manifestation of their citizenship right within their community and in front of the colonial administration, rested on the clear idea they had of their role and function. The community was created, therefore, in the social action and charity work. The act of generosity that established the notable has a reference and a recourse in face of the colonial administration. In competition with Christian philanthropy, the originaire notable imposed their civility as a pivotal organizing principle of the urban colonial society. The Abbe Boala violent recrimination and indictment of the island Catholic for appropriating not only the Muslim understanding and organization of baptismal ceremony and marriage, but their use of Islamic al amulet as well attest of the existence of this common culture. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we, we have time for just a few questions for Professor Dio before we adjourn to our reception. So, are there any questions out there? So actually, manipulation is a form of resistance. It's a way of using the force of your adversary to open a, up a space of their own. What is interesting in this situation is why I don't use the term of resistance. It's much more a logic of transaction. And that logic of transaction enabled the originaire to negotiate when they don't have any other choice or to do something else. And in the case, uh, if you want, one way for them of resisting uh, the civil code was that. I, I didn't dwell on that. But it's interesting to understand the legal system of citizenship in France. Citizenship is granted at, to an individual, not to a community. Citizenship was granted to the people of Saint Louis as a community, which is illegal. The second element, which is an important element, is that citizenship in France still today is based on the civil code. For a Muslim, one of the effects of accepting the civil code is actually excluding you from polygamy. You cannot be a French citizen and be a polygamist. It's the law. But these people were Muslim. They don't want to be 
They wanted to keep the polygamy thing. And actually, it is possible to argue that they use polygamy to show the French that they were not of French culture. Because the discussion was, they displaced the discussion between political and legal, and the legal terrain to actually a kind of religious, disconnecting the two and saying political legal right had, had nothing to do with political. But they understood also that the two moves were illegal. So you have this situation in which the colonial administration who needed them, because they were granted citizenship basically on saying they helped the French. They paid the most important tax for a citizen, the blood tax. They fought for France. And they participated, which is true, in the French conquests of part of West Africa. But the colonial administration was saying, based on that, they are citizens. Until 1917, from the French Revolution to 1917, generation of French magistrates kept saying, they are not French citizens. But at the same time, the contradiction was they were voting. So when they're saying they are voting, but they are not citizens. But you cannot not be citizen and vote. So, and you have this tension, which will be solved only in 1917, with the passing of a law illegally again at the National Assembly in France, giving them, the, 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 granting them citizenship once for all. So, so, so it's why it's very hard to see where is the resistance. Because they are getting what they want. They wanted a Muslim court, they got it. They wanted to be outside the civil code, they got it. They wanted a committee to go to Mecca, helped by the administration, they got it. Actually, the committee exists still today. They got it. They didn't want the French to discuss or take care of, the, of civil matters. We didn't have, Senegal didn't have a civil code and a marriage code until 1974. So they were happy. Why should they resist? What they did was through petition, through creating their own aspect. And sometimes it's very interesting. You know, if you read John Eilif's book on the history of the African poor. He say he cannot find African philanthropic activities before, actually, uh, before colonization. And, and somehow, the only way to deal with philanthropy in Africa is to look at the activity of the church. But in this case, precisely, the Philanthropy and social work was critical in maintaining and developing the civility of the four commune, but in also keeping the discussion with the French. And in 1914, they were able to elect a representative at the French National Assembly. And this also allowed them to be part of the system. They are not outside the system. They are part of a system. And what they are trying to find is a logic of their own. They are trying to be present in the colonial system, not to get outside of it. It's why it's very hard to, to say they resist. But they fight for their interests. So I'm just going to put it out there. How is this particular example different, say, from Northern Africa or from Vietnam? It's, 
It's totally different. The policy in this region was inspired by the French policy in Algeria. The governor considered as the the, 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 the founder of modern Senegal is Federbe. And when Federbe arrived in this region, he's a French general. He speaks fluently Arabic. And because of his understanding of Arabic, after less than five years, he writes the grammar of the three of the languages of this region. He speaks fluently the three main languages in five years because of Arabic. If you speak Arabic, you can learn more of very easily because 40% of the team of the vocabulary in war of is of Arabic origin, which create a kind of interesting thing. But at the same time, where the French were able in Senegal to basically transact with Muslim uh, notable. In Algeria, it was exactly the, the reverse. Islam was the element which distinguished radically the Algerian compared to the French. Is why at a point the French were forced to try to imagine an Algerian who was not French. And in some cases, they denied citizenship to the Algerian on the basis of their religion. In this case, they went overboard. And this is the only case in the history of France. You, are, you have a small group in, in India, Pondicherry, which benefit, and they are Muslim also, which had the same status. It's the two cases different. And actually, the difference also with Algeria, in particular for Saint Louis, is that Saint Louis is part of the old empire. It's not part of the 19th century empire, the colonial empire. It's part of the formation of the empire in the Americas. And it was treated as such. This is what defined, you know, this space has a, has a completely different, has a completely different space. Do we have time for one more question? Or just go to the reception? That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I keep, I'm keeping everybody from having <laughs> So uh, this is a fascinating, you know, uh, this whole idea of this transactional space on cultural and legal grounds and, this, and the development of the citizenship. Um, but what about economic citizenship? Um, what a, is there a unique story of economic rights um, in some way that we should be attuned to as well? Uh, absolutely. The economy was said you have two phases between the 18th century and the end of the 19th century. A first phase where the economy is centered on actually uh, slave traffic activities. You know, Saint Louisien, you know, the colonial administration, uh, the uh, company of Senegal which is controlling the space, basically dealing with the Senegambian aristocrats, getting slaves and shipping them. And you have a second phase where, with the consolidation of the territorial expansion, you have an economy centered along the Senegal River, from the lower Senegal to upper Senegal. And this is where the saint louis will play a critical role. Because of their mastery of Arabic, because of their mastery of the languages of this region, and because of their relation with the Mauritanian, they will actually begin fighting to control the trade. 
In the early 19th century, the French traders tried to displace them. They allied with the Métis, in particular to be able to import product. They began fighting with them, and they won. The Arabic gum was the most important product at the end of slavery. And the other important product was paper. Because, and this is one of the signals of the expansion of Islam. Because copying was an important element. It was the only way to archive knowledge. So, so they controlled it. And they, they began amassing fortune. Some of them, I studied one of them. Actually, his great granddaughter is here, who accumulated wealth, unimaginable wealth, in the, in the, 18, in, in the 19th century. Uh, he was born in 1840, died in 1910, went before the, the end of the 19th century, went four times to Mecca, used to go every year to buy books in Cairo. Alexandria and Jerusalem. So some of them were very, very wealthy. And you know, they, one, another one had the monopoly of importing tea in this region. And the Mauritanians, tea is central to the history of all this region. So they accumulated a lot of wealth and they were able to resist also, you know, competing with the French. And it worked until, if you want, the, the change of the flux between the river, which is no longer playing an important role, and the western part, is the emergence of a new economy, which was based on groundnuts. And it displaced them. Two things displaced them. One, the reorientation of the economy, and the second, which is very important, it was the cultural dimension of their success. They were part of the cultural complex of this region. But, and it's people who used to live along the river for six to seven months and come back to St. Louis. And usually they will have another wife at the, where they are operating. Which means that their kids, their kids went to school, French school, and they didn't have the culture of their fathers. And they were unable to take over. It was the end of the, end of the cultural transmission is also the end of their economy. But they were very, very powerful. And it's important to see today that you know, their, their, their grand and great grandkids has been fighting to actually bring back the memory of entrepreneurship of this group. But it's an entrepreneurship which lasted from the end of the 18th century to the end of the 19th century. So please join me in thanking Professor Diop.